The typical SRA story displays uniform essential elements, whether or not the story is discovered by a therapist, social worker, or parent, and whether or not the victim is an adult or a child. The victims usually are in intensely religious or has a religious background. The typical adult victim is highly suggestible, intelligent, creative, and well-learned, if not well-educated. They seek counseling help for a seemingly unrelated problem, and they sincerely believe their stories. The victim Victimizers. They involve immediate family members, caregivers in regular custody of the victim, and the perpetrators, preschool teachers, daycare workers, etc. The SRE abuse. Emotional, physical, sexual, spiritual. Although victims typically cannot reproduce the intricacies of occult ritual beyond what is commonly available in general bookstores or what they have heard from other victims or therapists, the ritual elements of the abuse are always satanic or occult. Common features of satanic ceremony folklore such as the black mass, human sacrifice, drinking of blood, and satanic symbols are common. The SRA Disclosure Usually, adult SRA stories are disclosed in a therapeutic setting. Repressed Memories of SRA After long-term intensive therapy with a therapist committed to believing the client, no matter what the client discloses, the alleged adult survivor will gradually piece together a complete personal SRA history, disassociative state, or multiple personality disorder. Can we, for just a quick second, tell? can we explain to people your specific birthday and what that meant to them and why you were chosen because of your birthday? Yeah, it was February 15th, 1954, which is the uh, feast of the Roman god Lupercus, and we were driven somewhere. I still haven't exactly identified the place, but I'm pretty sure I know where it was and uh, where there was a uh, ceremony around a bonfire and there were a number of different elements involved in it, but at the uh, midpoint of the ceremony, a knife was placed in my hand and uh, I was forced to shove that knife into, into the uh, chest of my friend Mark and watched him die. Regarding the California Code Penal Code, every person, not the actual killer, who, with the intent to kill, aids, abets, counsels, commands, induces, solicits, requests, or assists any actor in the commission of murder in the first degree shall be punished by death or imprisonment in the state prison for life without the possibility of parole. If one or more of the special circumstances enumerated or subdivisions A has been found to be true under sections 1 90-4, Code Section Penal 799, felonies, murder, other offenses punishable by death or life imprisonment, embezzlement, or public funds, none. California's criminal statute of limitation sets limits for how long a prosecutor may wait to file formal criminal charges. As in other states, there is no time limit to bring charges of crime such as murder or embezzlement of public funds. I mean, I thought I must be losing my mind because this didn't fit anything in my in my daily memories. I find that very hard to believe. By 1986, there had already been quite a bit of information about supposed satanic cults. The book, Michelle Remembers, came out in 1980 and caused quite a bit of controversy, especially around the religious, and news of it spread like crazy. The book, Satan Seller by Mike Warnke, was published in 1973 and had already been in circulation for 13 years prior, and it too warranted quite a bit of attention, especially among the religious. Even John Todd had been going around speaking. Chief, man, what do you want to do tonight? The same thing we do every night, Pinky. Try, Try to take, take over, over the, the world. world. Just like the Bible says, it's basically an intergalactic invasion into this space through people. I, I'm telling you, it's what all the ancients said, it's what they warned of, it's what we're dealing with. They're demons. And the satanic cult and coven that's in this, hidden in this Christian church, lives like a Christian. Okay, not every one of them, because I wasn't, and I know some, a couple other who weren't. Repent but. now, repent now. A Secretary of State that has had sex in giant vats of feces. They have sexual rituals, some of the most ancient Egyptian rituals, where they believe they are possessed by entities, basically space aliens. The minions of the evil one can travel through telephone lines they can travel through cable TV. They can travel through the internet into your computer. Repent now, repent now. I used to worship this guy, okay? And, um, I don't know if you can see it well on my camera, but you can uh, have a look at this one here, okay? 
They're freaking interdimensional invaders, okay? I'll just say it. Make fun of me all you want. I don't think I've ever laughed this hard on air. Oh my God, it's so ridiculous. Uh, and I literally went to two therapists, both of which said, well, part of the problem is you've got hidden memories and the only way we can get through it is hypnosis. And I said, that's ridiculous. I know my life and I'm not going to let some head shrink kick around in my brain. I said, I know my life. And what the second guy said, well, how much of your childhood do you actually remember? And it was a sea change moment for me because I realized I'd blocked out about 80% of it or more. And hey, once Jack, I made that, Greg, yeah. sorry, I do think there's something really interesting in the chat room. And I, and I think that um, it's, wor it's worth discussing because these are topics that come up on a regular basis and you're not new to this idea. Uh, but we have somebody in there that asked the question, you know, in the course of your testimony, the question was, okay, so this guy committed murder. And then they've, they're going off about how they have to notify the police and this and that. But let's let's just address that for a minute, and and uh, um, and I'll let you do it if you don't if you don't mind. You know, just with what's being said in there about needing to call the police and all of that. Let's yeah, say right. this person. Let's yeah, say right. this person. Yeah, let's say let's say this. Let's just say though that, that for people that don't understand this topic, that this is shocking news. They look at you and they say, "You just admitted." To having been part of something in that you committed murder, that you you were part of the murdering process, what do you say to that when somebody in the world asks you that question? Well, I love that question because I first had had that thrown at me when we were thrown at you. That seems like a reasonable and very legitimate question and deserves a follow-up. Was there ever a police report filed? What happened with any investigation? Did you report it? You have a responsibility to report it as soon as you can, regardless of a few days or a few decades. There is no statute of limitations on murder in the state of California. Uh, down at a, a, a college in Waco, we had about a thousand people we're speaking to. And I had shared that part, and just some stranger out of nowhere opened up the side door and yelled in the middle of my testimony, said, are you admitting to murder? Is that what you're doing? They opened up a side door and yelled inside. That seems odd. Why didn't they just join the audience? Were they standing there, eavesdropping, waiting for that specific moment? Why did no one see them standing outside the door? And why would such an, an obvious question garner so much animosity from you? I thought, well, I don't know who sent you, but let me tell you something, partner. If you don't understand how this works, then you need a little educating. I well, was let's, 11, let's educate. Let's, yeah, educate. let's educate. I was, first of all, I was 11 years old. Secondly, I was drugged. Thirdly, this was in 1964 when this stuff was not the kind of thing you just, there was no 911 at the time. I'm out in the middle of nowhere. I'm probably 20 miles from the, lo the, the, the nearest house. Uh, so I'm going to go to the police. I don't even know what's happening to me. I just know that I just watched my best friend die, and I'm so drugged that I don't even know where I'm at. And the next thing you know, for the next three weeks, I'm sick. I can't even get out of bed. I wouldn't expect you to call 911 during the ceremony. However, at some point, you became confident enough to publicly speak on this and make accusations. So, yes, why did you not feel confident enough to also relay the knowledge to the proper authorities about the kidnapping and murder you witnessed as soon as you possibly could? You have a moral and civic responsibility to report it. Yeah, so, and, and on top of that, though, you weren't the only person there. I mean, they literally they're they're forcing you through this process. You've got guiding, you've got guiding intelligences behind you, guiding human intelligences behind this that are using you, right? Absolutely, and I would challenge anyone, anyone who has an eleven-year-old relative, ten or eleven-year-old relative, to ask themselves uh, if if they would be in themselves capable of doing something like that. And the abs the answer is absolutely not. There were, and, and here's why. I and mean, let's just get gritty with it for a minute. Eleven year old children usually do not have the strength to put a knife through a sternum. It usually right. takes adult strength to get that blade through the bone. 
Actually, most adults don't have enough strength to pierce a sternum. Bone is incredibly strong. It is five times stronger than steel in density. Also, holding an 11 year old child's hands over the hilt of a knife would interfere with the necessary force one would need to stab someone. My grievance is not with the method of murder or the accused. It is the simple fact that Mr. Reed has admitted to having knowledge of a murder and has a responsibility to report it. That is my concern. No, exactly. And, you know, I remember the sights. I remember the smells. I remember the sound of the bone crunch. I, I remember uh, the, 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 everything going on in the background. I could see and hear the fire in the background. I stood there and watched while they uh, prepared my friend. There were two female attendants who prepared him with oils and different flowers and stuff he was so out of it he was looking at me i was looking at him we couldn't even talk uh, we were so drugged we couldn't even talk we just looked at each other with that look of i don't know what i, I he had the look of just he, he had no idea and and when the final thing happened he, it was almost like a look of surprise I would imagine he was very surprised. I also imagine that all these details you remember would be incredibly valuable to the police. Possibly after all these years, there might have been other witnesses who had a change of heart and reported this. Your details would be invaluable to reopening this case. That is, again, assuming this actually happened, and it's not just a lantern memory that you have convinced yourself having. And then that was it. So. I get pretty worked up about this because the very reason that they choose children, at least one of the reasons, is so that the children themselves will carry the guilt of what helped, what happened, and feel like they can never get free of what they think they were responsible for. I had two hands on top of my two little hands like this, going like this, and for years, I had to carry the guilt of thinking, I'm the one that did it. And I wasn't the one that did it. But this is what these people do. It's part of what they do. You talked about being chosen, okay? Now, in this situation, two people were chosen. You were chosen for a specific purpose, and Mark was chosen for a specific purpose. You've kind of talked a little bit about your background, where you came from, your birthday, your family connections and you ending up kind of in the care of this group and they had infiltrated the church and all that so that's one thing and talk of as much as you want about that because we want people to understand it but um and i, I want to remember to uh answer this question because this is a good question um that's brought up in the uh, chat room what happened to the body that was my question. Uh, my other question is, how was Mark chosen? But that's the question that we always hear. Where are the bodies? Where are the bodies? Where are the bodies? I've heard that for years, where are the bodies? That's a very good question, and there's a good answer for it. So, But I, I've laid a couple things out there, and if you forget it, well, I'll ask you again, Greg. But first question is, how was Mark chosen, or what, what was his purpose? Mark was born to the breed. As far as I've been able to ascertain, that was what he was born into. His purpose was to get kids like me for whatever, uh, either pornographic purposes or, or for ritual type things. But I think based on at least what I've been able to research, <laughs> Mark's real purpose was just to uh, be the sacrificial lamb when the time came. Uh, so to speak, on his uh, 13th birthday, because it was his birthday. And um, that seems to be important to some of these groups to take a child of that age and sacrifice them as an offering to whatever gods they uh, they might be worshiping. So he was basically, in a human sense, he was born for nothing. He was born to die, which is, you know, to this day is very hard for me to talk about. And it's why I decided to go public when I didn't have to talk about any of this stuff. 
You are conflating pantheons and you are claiming there is some ritual based on the winter solstice involving human sacrifice. And what does this have to do with the festival of Lupercalia? Your story is inconsistent. You didn't have to talk about this. Actually, <laughs> yeah, you do. You have a moral and civic responsibility to report this crime. I know I am repeating myself, but it all comes down to this. As I mentioned, California does not have a statute of limitations on murder. But I wanted people to know that he lived and that he died and his life mattered and, and that he was somebody. He wasn't just some throwaway thing for a bunch of evil freaks that think that they can do this to kids and get it over, get away with it. So that was pretty much his purpose. And then your second thing about body disposal, uh, it doesn't take much. You know, we went through a real round bout with, Ken Lanning and the FBI for a number of years, and this is, well, Ken Lanning says this doesn't happen, and if this is true, where are the bodies? Look, as early as, way back in the 80s, we could have told you for sure, you can buy a portable crematorium back then for approximately $1,500 and dispose of a body. You can take the bodies and place them in truckers' lime pits. Uh, where they dispose of the carcasses of dead animals that are in transportation. There are numbers, so there are crematoriums here where I lived that have been used. Greg Reed covering his ass in three, two, one. Allegedly. Again, from Kenneth Lanning's 1991 FBI report on alleged satanic cult crimes. Any professional evaluating victims' allegations of ritualistic abuse cannot ignore the lack of physical evidence. No bodies or physical evidence left by violent murderers. The difficulty in successfully committing a large-scale conspiracy crime the more people involved in any crime conspiracy, the harder it is to get away with. And human nature. Intergroup conflicts resulting in individual self-serving disclosures are likely to occur in any group involved in organized kidnapping, baby breeding, and human sacrifice. It is not that easy to completely destroy all evidence and eliminate a human corpse. The more witnesses you have, the more the evidence spreads. For disposal of bodies, you just have to have the right people in place. Uh, they're not going to leave evidence. If they do leave evidence, it's because they want to send a message. That's one thing I did learn. But it's kind of a no-brainer for me. Mark, they just threw him on a fire. Crematoriums have ovens especially designed to maintain a temperature well above 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit. To burn a body to ash, it takes two to three hours. The cremation produces about three to nine pounds of evidence. Sorry. I meant to say ashes. A well-maintained bonfire reaches temperatures of about 1100 degrees Fahrenheit with the core inner charcoal reaching up to about 2012 degrees Fahrenheit. That would be one huge bonfire seen for miles around to have the charcoal hot enough and large enough to cremate a human body. Again, it would take two to three hours and still produce ash. Yep. Secrecy is one of their weapons. And they will throw their own under the bus, so to speak, to protect the, uh, you know, the whole of the cult, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. And they'll they'll sacrifice they'll sacrifice anybody to protect the secrets of the cult. Wow. So every single member is constantly and unquestionably loyal, never straying away. Personal conflicts never arise. Everyone is silent, loyal, and 100% complacent 100% of the time. Have you ever met a real Satanist? If you don't mind, let's just talk about some of the, like, I would say the psychological ramifications that she suffered after that. What's the difference between a fracture and then splitting? Well, I didn't lose time for one thing, um, but I did have the ability to uh, wall myself off if things got in a bad place or if someone confronted me. There were other, it's like things took over. It's called broad selective memory, or BS memories for short, also known as Bill Schlobinitis. To defend me, it's not, and it may have been another part of my character of maybe a fragment of my personality, but there was no time loss. It was simply that uh, one moment I could be this very kind, uh, loving person next minute, I could be extraordinarily angry and evil and just do the most evil things. 
and uh, it it was uh, it affected obviously what they did. The best way I know how to describe it is when my dad confronted me one day and said, "What happened to that sweet innocent child that we used to know?" And I said, "Dad, he died." And uh, it really shocked him because he had no idea what I was talking about. I didn't know everything that happened to me. I just know I went from some kid that loved church and loved God, and all of a sudden I didn't want to go to church. So the satanic cult turned you into a rebellious teenager? Was that their ultimate goal? Is that why all the events you portrayed unfolded? So you would become a rebellious teenager? And I was angry. I started drinking hardcore when I was 11. I mean, hardcore. And then I just went down the black hole of occultism and started doing everything and anything I could relating to the occult. And I think, well, everything, but actually study and learn what the occult really is. I think whatever they had planned for me, and it's only in later years that I've understood, and I'm going to get a little graphic here, and so y'all just have to, we're all big boys and girls here. Part of what happened to me during this ceremonial ritual thing is when I was very young, probably around eight, it was probably before the incident with Mark, um, I was sodomized and in a ritual setting, and they called on a particular demonic whatever to actually inhabit me. And I had no idea why they did that until later, and I started studying real world black magic practices and that's what they call creating a magic mirror. Really? Are you sure you weren't abducted by aliens who anally probed you and you just blocked that memory out? No, there is no ritual or even any concept of sodomizing a child to use as a black mirror in any occult book. A magic mirror is a divination tool. It can take the form of a reflective surface, a crystal ball, a crystal, a black mirror, even a black surface, etc. Where they will take a young boy and as they say, the best one to do, this is an innocent child, six to eight years of age. And they do this in order to totally destroy the child's defenses. And so that they can use that child for the purposes of divination. Uh, so it was clear to me in retrospect that all these things that they did were not random and that they needed, I guess, part of the cohesiveness uh, that I would carry so that they could continue to use me for occultic purposes when they eventually uh, brought me back into the group because I'm starting to wonder if you are crazier than a loon. The satanic cult risks so much kidnapping, committing murder, disposing a body, and keeping everyone silent about it, including members of a church and assuming the possibility of the entire staff and other possible witnesses, all for the purpose of turning you into a divination tool. How would they access the divination? Would you go into trance and relay prophetic information? How exactly would they use you as a divination tool, or a black mirror as you call it? People that are fragmented don't have quite the capacity that people who um, manage to survive those terrors would. So I think that might have been, been part of the equation. But make no mistake about it, it was a horrible, horrible ride trying to survive this and trying to get healed from this. It was a long, long journey, and I can only thank Jesus that I'm as intact as I am because I shouldn't be. Yes, let's thank Jesus, not the therapist or the police you reported this to. Oh, wait, you never reported any of this to the police, did you? So, I guess this is the portion of the story where we move on to the healing power of Christ, not the results of an investigation, a trail of convictions, or any of the perpetrators, no autopsy report on Mark, follow up with his parents, and the pursuit of justice. Nothing, just move along to thanking God that you're okay. I, I've seen the same thing with investigators and like um, juvenile detectives. You know, do, when you have, I talked to one firsthand. Not to, he spent twenty years working um, as a juvenile detective, which just means he worked with kids' cases. And when he's just dealing with family issues and you know sexual abuse, physical abuse, things that didn't really even relate to satanic stuff even though it's all technically satanic in some way. I mean, but you guys, see, it's not, it's not an SRA cop. It's all basically satanic 